let's start out with the fact that it's been 10 years since you guys joined the Marvel Universe um, back on Iron Man. What has changed? And, and did you see it going 10 years? And, of course, many more, I'm sure. What are both your thoughts on that? Uh, no, I never uh, thought that it would be the, the Marvel Universe that it became. Um, you know, the first, I'll, you know, Shane can say his story with it, but it just seems at the time, you know, it's one movie at a time. And then, and then as we progress from, you know, the second one into the third movie, that you you start seeing the bigger picture that, that uh, Kevin and Lewis and Victoria and, and the whole team had over there. Um, so, um, so the, the brief answer was, would be no. I, I, I didn't see it uh, coming, and and it just the way it connected with the audience. Um, you know, it's it's so such a massive thing now, and um, and they, you know the brilliance that they have in, in in connecting all the stories and the characters and the, and changing the types of movies that are getting made every time, so that that you're not um, uh, bored by the, the, you know, or, or it's not predictable what the next movie is going to be. You know, it's one time it's like you know it's an action movie, the next time it's a bit more of a comedy. Um, so I, I like the way that Marvel change it up all the time, but yet still manage to keep it cohesive in their world. And how about you, Shane? Uh, how do you feel about the fact that there have been so many films and yet the quality has stayed so high? Uh, did you see that coming, or, or is it been a surprise? Um, I mean, it's pretty much what Lindsay just stated. I think back in the – here's the thing that I always marvel at, pardon the pun. I didn't <laughs> mean to – no, really. The uh, other franchises that, that work work well because they have a um, – uh, Fan base, you know, like like the Terminator films, for instance. I I find it fascinating, incredible, almost that 30 years later, Arnold is still making Terminator movies. You know, yeah. And and, and at the time when it's a one-off, you know, and at that at that sort of miracle moment in time in 1983, you know, with your dad and Jim and like it was just sort of a, a, a unique, what seems like a one-time thing, right? But when it's successful and you make, you know, it's sort of a testament to, to fans, film fans, and, and what why they want to see a continuation of a story. You know that, that you're still making these movies, and the Marvel team took it. Not by accident, like like how some films are, like with sequels. It was sort of accidental. But they really had a plan. They had a huge master plan that was sort of secret unto themselves in terms of they had inherited a massive archive of comic book stories. And in the comics, too, they cross over. You know, there's like the the characters meet and they they carry on, but I, I don't think that it, it I don't think that they would have made it to the ten year mark had the first film not been successful. I think if if under the under the direction of John Favreau and and the that first film's credibility had that failed, I don't think that that it would have really been maybe as as successful as it has been. So I think that that was very smart on there. I mean, it was just a really great uh, first-time launch for their for their company as well. Yeah, I think the stars just aligned perfectly yeah, on that. Yeah, but they had a plan behind it. It wasn't like they made up the plan after the fact. They, they, they definitely had – Kevin Feige had – my understanding inherited sort of the position from Avi Arad to a certain degree to run the film division. But he's a comic book fan. I mean, Kevin is 
is uh, usually our go-to guy for comic book information. You know, like if you don't understand a character or the origin, he's very accessible. He'll, you know, he's, he's he'll get on the phone and tell you like where they're from and what the origin is, and and uh, it's pretty impressive, you know. To, to interconnect, and and it's been a building for a long time. They they had you know tiers of of wa- you know waves of films that were um, initial films, introductory films like Thor, like Ant Man, like uh, Black Panther. You know you have you have these introductory films that kind of reconnect Doctor Strange. Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, all these different things. And then they, they had a master plan to, at some point, connect everything, which was Avengers. After Civil War, then there was the uh, Infinity War. The Infi- what's interesting is during Thor 1, there's the, the Hall of Armor. It's a, it's a brief shot. It's a little shot, but you, there's a tracking shot down the Hall of Armor on Asgard, and one of the pieces in the in the uh, the hall is the Infinity Glove. And I remember telling, I think it was you, I was like, "Is that the Infinity Glove?" Yeah. Like that's cool. Like like, what does that mean? You know? And uh, of course, it's all calculated and planned out. Even little, you know, little uh, Easter eggs like that. But I thought that uh, we were at, I think we were at Mark 52 of the Iron Man suit, from Mark 1 to Mark 52. And I sent John Favreau an email, and I said, you know, listen, it's, a, it's been an amazing journey. We started with Mark 1, and we are now at Mark 52. And, and uh, he wrote something back that was that was pretty cool. It was just like, you know, the 10-year mark, and, and it's like it's been amazing. You know, it is kind of an amazing thing because it, it doesn't feel like 10 years have gone by. Not at all. But, but they certainly have. I think also the genius that um, Marvel have, and it started with that first movie, was in how they cast their characters. I mean, you can't imagine... Tony Stark being anybody else other than Robert Downey. I mean, he's just that part, you know, and, and if, I think if he hadn't had that role, that um, would it have been as successful as it was? I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Um, but they, they are... I mean, he's part of the charm. Out of the suit, the guy has to be charming and, and yeah. interesting. The suit's just a, a, an appendage of his, you know... Mm-hmm. Super, you know, he's really not, he, he's not born with superhero powers like Thor or, you know, some of the other characters. It's a machine that has to make him great, so it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Well, I, I agree with you guys about just clearly how well thought out it is 10 years later. that They they were juggling so many things, and, and I believe, I think Avengers Infinity War is, is right up there with Iron Man. It's probably my favorite along with Iron Man. Yeah. Um, exactly. You know, and it, it could have easily fallen on its face. They were serving so many characters, and yet it, it really worked. And, and the obviously, you know, spoiler alert, I mean, the stakes they set up are unbeatable. I mean, it's, it's no, it was really, pretty, really pretty great. It was impressive because, I, I mean, I thought for the – for um, – the Russo brother director team, they gave everybody a great entrance and a great exit. And that, yeah. the, it was, that's hard to do in a two-hour period. Like, everybody got, like, a moment that seemed right. I love the fact that Tony Stark didn't have any idea who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. I mean, those <laughs> are the funnier moments for me. Like, they, and, and Guardians didn't, you know... Uh, you know, um, Scott, what's his name? Um, Guardians. Star Wars? Star Wars, yeah. yes. Star Wars. Is that what they call? I can't yeah. remember. Um, 
he didn't, he, you know, he's jealous of Thor. I, I thought that kind of stuff was really yeah. what, is, what makes the movie charming. <laughs> so hilarious. Um, I'm going to segue now. Uh, we've talked about the filmmakers and what a great uh, job they and Kevin, the production team, did in, in making a great movie. And can you guys talk to me about the the challenges uh, in Avengers Infinity War, some of the highlights of, of the work you did on the film? And I guess we can start with – want to start with the Mark 50 and we can work our way through. I know you did makeups for Guardians of the Galaxy. Let me start there, the Mark 50 elements. Well, I think, I think that with the with the the uh, liquid metal, what was it called? Um, the actual suit, the liquid blood. Uh, I can't remember the. the, the <laughs> it's been so long that I can't remember the the, the, the name of it. But the blood. Uh, anyway, the liquid metal um, uh, suit. What was great about that was that um, it was different from all the other suits it was in that that um in the story of course it, it it comes out through his pores and and wraps around him um and so it was a much more organic looking suit than any of the other suits in the past uh so therefore the suit itself had to be made uh with much more flexible materials than normal and um which you know caused us to have to figure out different painting techniques and materials on that to make sure that the, the gold and the silver and then the, uh, the metallic red wouldn't flake off. Um, and um, so that was kind of cool that to take it, you know, that, you know, step further in, in the construction process. And then also, it was, you know, it was great knowing that Robert actually wears the suit. Um, you know, there's this myth that, that Robert never wears a suit, which is is not true. Um, he he um, wore that suit all yeah. the time, so it was it was great. Even in Civil War, there just is a myth that 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 the actors don't wear the suits anymore, and that's it's not the case. Now, suits, the suits are are the connective tissue is more CGI now. We've learned from Iron Man one because uh, it, you know it's a learning curve from you know, uh, the Iron Man One. It's a hard shell. It's much uh, the way to describe it is it's like a lobster shell. You know, there's there's a small area of flexibility, but then there are hard shells, and and we thought that was the correct way to go because of of the nature of what it is. But as we've gone along, we've we've made even if they're supposed to be hard shells, we, we use semi flexible materials, and uh, they have a slight bit of compression to them. Every suit's been built and, and, and dealt with differently. There's no formula that runs through. Every every design that Ryan Minerding and his team come up with require different things, more lights, more, more, more uh, coverage, different shapes. But the, uh, the final one, 50 or 52, I can't remember what the, the number is, Mark, um, it was very tight to the body and much more sort of like uh, you know, had an organic flair to it. So, like Lindsay said, it was really super flexible. And and uh, it was very comfortable. Also, along the way, you know, Robert, oh, on every show, uh, he, he puts in a request for, you know, what he would like. He would like the neck to be able to be removed. He'd like to be able to, you know, take the arms off easily. So we, we have to modify to the actor's uh, request, which is fair, because they're in it all day long. And uh, uh, the compliment we got from from Feige on the on the uh, the final suit was, you know, it was delivered, put on, on set, lit up. And uh, Kevin thought it was the best suit to date. He just thought it was the best looking thing so far. So. It's always good to hear, and it's and it's good to have uh, uh, been along for the progressive journey. But that's just one character. That you've got you know, you've got um, uh, elements of Thor. We did Thor's uh, metal armored arms this time, mm -hmm. which were really challenging because 
different facilities have made the arms in the past. Uh, Chris Hemsworth didn't really um, enjoy how they felt or how they restricted his movement. So we spent a lot of time traveling back and forth, taking measurements and, and doing prototypes and coming up with the right balance of muscle versus what material, multiple things. I mean, um, and just how, and and taking to know how much his muscles, the, the shape changes when he flexes. Yeah. Um, so you don't, uh, you know, impede his movement or, or cut off his, his circulation. So there's a lot of, of um, back and forth with with. Um, yeah, it was, all it was really it was really it seemed like such a simple thing. It seems like really a simple thing to say, Thor's uh, armored chiclet arms. <laughs> I think, well, okay, that, that seems good. But it was absolutely one of the hard, it was much harder than making Tony Stark suit. Yes. Well, you know, th this is a cast of very fit people, but Hemsworth is on a whole new level. <laughs> you have to take into account the, the oh. size of his flexing biceps. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I know you guys came back and worked on Winter Soldier as well. Any, any modifications to how you handled uh, Sebastian's? He, he's uh, got, you know, the first one was challenging, really challenging, because uh, we wanted to make a seamless, reflective, flexible arm, and we did. And then uh, it, it, that was the point where we were really starting to experiment with mirror-like flexible paint, which is really difficult. And then the, the other ones, uh, the, the arms were streamlined down and sculpted, uh, you know, really, really nicely. Uh, I think Juan, Juan Song, Juan Il Song, our artist here, sculpted the, uh, digitally sculpted those arms and, and really tight, really nice. But that was from Ryan. Yeah, they're always they're always the designs from Marvel in terms. Of, but the, and then you know we have them come over and sit with us and make sure that the, to the specs. And and what was that? What was that cast in his arm? It's a urethane. It's a flexible urethane, almost like a silicone feel to it. Mm -hmm. You know what's what's actually really great about the, having been fortunate enough to work on on so many of the Marvel movies is that you learn from every movie you do. You learn for the next one, and so um, the Winter Soldier arm informed how we did uh, Nebula's arm for Guardians of the Galaxy two. Because um, in that movie, her arm was uh, her metal arm was was a foam appliance from the fir in the in the first movie that yeah. was done in England, um, and um, and so we were asked by James Gunn to make that um, a little bit more um, metallic. metallic and 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 uh, a kind of a more s sort of stronger looking arm, but still keeping the same design, and so we used the knowledge that we we. Uh, gotten from the, the Winter Soldier arm, and then when we had to then move into doing the new Winter Soldier arm, again, we the things that we learned from doing Nebula's arm, we then incorporated into the new Winter Soldier arm. So, so, so you're, you're, we're constantly improving yeah. uh, on what we do. Um, sort of cross-pollinating the, the yeah. techniques. And, and how cool! And how cool that you guys have gotten to go back to this universe so many times, and really finesse these builds. Um, it's so rare. It's so rare to well, get that. That's that's it's lucky. You're right because you know the third time is a charm. Usually, it's like you figured out because every as you know and remember from from even being with your dad, most most effects are a prototype. You're yep. just showing up with the prototype hoping that it works. In a real industry, that would have been merely a prototype, and then you would have done it again and done it again and, and, until it was perfected. So that's really how we feel about, you know, getting the size, maintaining, you know, there are certain formulas, certain rules. The head has to be small. The waist has to be small. You know, like you, you, can't, you can't bend some of the rules of, of proportion. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and, um, you know, we we will take the artwork that uh, the Marvel team provide and then and restructure it to fit over a human body sometimes, but we, we don't 
want to mess with too much. Real, one of the big achievements we had was correcting Captain America's helmet. That's one thing I'm actually really proud of because they were going to establish him without a helmet because it just didn't look or feel right. And um, Civil War, we're like, listen, you know, give us a chance to work with Ryan and the guys and just really make this thing look heroic and cool. And uh, and we did. And, and Chris Evans liked it so much, he wanted to wear it for additional scenes. And he was like, and then he, he caught himself. He's like, am I crazy? Did I just say that? Like, was it, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, he, did, he did look really cool in it, you know. And what sort of alterations have you made for his comfort over over the years? Which one? Uh, for the Captain America helmet, because it's very well, tight fitting. It, it's tight fitting, but there's secret hinges and buckles, and uh, you know, Chris Swift was very uh, instrumental on on creating the fixture for that. So you know, we would work with the design and then figure out how to invisibly make little hooks and, and magnets and so on and, and, you know, make it so it comes on and off. Usually the request is actors want these things to come on and off within seconds. You know, you can't, you can't pull out the drill gun and start undrilling them. And it has to be, like, very quick, very, uh, you know. They give us about ten minutes to get suited up these days. It was, it was really nice, that particular job, it was really nice because um, that was a really important character for Ryan Minerding. Um, and and we, you know, we wanted to, to make sure that we gave him the, the best that we could. And so he would come over, you know, we'd, we'd work on the design of the, of, the, of the 3D model. We'd bring him over, get his notes on things, change it up, do the same thing again, grow certain pieces of it to make sure that it was, it was looking correct because sometimes when you model in 3D it, it's weird how you, you you see it on the screen and the perspective whether it's on or off still um, it looks different to how you see it in the real world so um, you know you, you can be fooled sometimes by what you're seeing on the screen so Doing a back and forth of, of working digitally and then and then making a, a, a real world piece, looking at that, correcting what what you thought looked great in 3D but in reality it doesn't quite work as well as as you thought it did, and then going back, altering it and then bringing it back into the the real world, um, really helps. And so um, I, that was one of my favorite things to have done on this was working with with. Ryan and making sure that he was happy with with uh, the captain's helmet because it was such an iconic uh, piece of the movie. So, um, yeah, very exciting doing that with him. Now, before we – I know you guys did some design maquettes for Thanos and the Black Order and, and Groot, but before we go there, that will be our next topic. I would love to hear just a little bit about uh, Falcon, um, any, any of the challenges on, on that costume. Um, on Falcon, they, they, um, a lot of that was, was really just um, making uh, essentially the same uh, costume from the, from the prior movie, uh, but just doing it in different coloring. Um, he, as I recall, uh, it, it was much darker um, for, for this movie than it was in the prior one. Um, we did do the um, uh, the little red drone for to that um, for this for this movie, which was cool, um, and uh, that was it for a lighting reference piece. Um, but my recollection, uh, Shane had to pop out. He'll be back in a second. But um, was that it was really more about making sure that. Um, but the colors of the, the costume and the pieces that we made for the costume uh, worked together, and the colorings didn't didn't um, didn't change too much from from a hard piece that's supposed to look like a fabric to the actual fabric piece that was dyed. So um, 
it was really just um, tightening up that that particular character. I don't think it was there was a lot of it. There was quite a number of of um, copies to do, but it wasn't too. Um, we didn't have to, you know, innovate anything on that. That right. costume. It was it was pretty much the same as the prior one, just different color. We're talking about uh, the uh, the Falcon. We just really think it's just color. Yeah, there was a couple structural things to the backpack. You know, and, and there's always working. I'm sure Lindsay mentioned working with the costume departments are always really integral. And there's a lot of combo work. And um, Gigiana, uh Marcus Malkovich, Mikowski, Mikowski, Malkovich. She's she she's great to work with. She she's very meticulous and yeah. um, knows her stuff really really well. So it's always uh, a challenge, but yet yeah, a lot of fun working with her and her team to make sure that everything works together well and um it's super challenging the the timing is never great really just because of the nature of filmmaking these days actors availability fittings delivery schedules you know other parts of the world these are like james bond movies they're all they're shot all around the world so you know there's a lot of there's a lot of traveling involved and um uh, you just have to be really prepared and really try to understand what they're doing because because most of the times we're working without a script. <laughs> the scripts are secret, and um, not always. I mean, not always, but but on some of these films, so this this one in particular, this one in particular, even the actors didn't have scripts and. and um, I really don't know how they pulled it off. How uh, the producer Michael Grillo and um, and and um, uh, Joanne Peritano and Jason Tamez, i don't know how they pulled it off. But you know, we get scene descriptions and deliveries. You know, you have to be in Edinburgh, you know, <laughs> October tenth, and you have to have this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And and then, you know, it, it really was like that. You know. Well, I think that speaks to the trust this uh, p- producing team has earned that that uh, the crew is willing to work that way because uh, yeah. it, it it held together beautifully. Um, you guys didn't really need to see the script apparently because it looks so good. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on to because we've been going a bit, and I want to let you guys get back to your day. I would love to talk about those design maquettes uh, and. Uh, any anything you want to share with me about about those and the purpose for them, uh, the Thanos and the Black Order and the Teenage Group is what I'm referring to. Well, it's it's become a new uh, sort of um, category of, of work because of visual effects. Because honestly, we we think of ourselves as um, uh, the physical branch of visual effects. That's that's how I would describe us. Today, it's not. It, it encompasses a lot of things: costumes, props, Makeup. makeups, uh, set pieces, and now uh, physical maquettes, which are are used as a tool for the, the digital department. And the scale of them being three to four feet tall has been deemed necessary because that's it. it it doesn't defy the size as much as a smaller maquette would do with the light, how light plays on it. It suddenly becomes the ambient light and light reflect, reflect, refractions and reflections are not too much different than they would be if it was six feet tall, if you understand what I'm saying. Like, I, I do. I remember you guys had to build a, a pretty much close to one-to-one Hulk bust uh, for, yeah, we did that. I'm trying to remember which one, but now you don't have to go to that scale. That's what you're saying. One, one-to-one Hulk bus was used for different reasons because they were really trying to capture the hair and, and the lighting on okay. it. Okay. Much, much bigger. But uh, the that group in this film, because there's a lot of CGI characters, the 
the effects teams need to capture those those in situation ambient light settings for their team. So we built something that was essentially a circus train of of very sophisticated uh, covered wagon trolley kind of transport. Mm -hmm. You know, like these things were on these uh, really elaborate uh, uh, carry carry boxes that were on. You know, Chris and the guys could hook them together and and pull three or four at the set because they're massive. You know, they're like massive things. And that was almost more complex than making the the actual maquettes, but because it's it's difficult when you're on set and in weird locations to, to to haul these things around or get to set quickly, you know, without them getting damaged or or people seeing them, so they have to be covered up and uh, stored that way. But they become they become a very useful tool. And I think if, if that helps make the CGI look better, then that's that's what we aim to do. Go ahead, Lindsay. Sorry, go ahead. They, they, um, they were, we got access from from uh, Ryan Minerding's team, um, but um, to 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 grow these maquettes the size that they they are, we have to go in and. Um, and tighten those models up, put structures put inside structure. of them, uh, uh, model it in such a way that, that you can really get the, the tight detail that, that is required for the visual effects department. And so a lot of R&D went into the Black Order um, because all of them have very intricate um, costumes. Yeah. And... Um, and uh, I can't remember which, which what the name of it is. Was like, was like a, yeah, like I have to look for yeah. That one was super complicated. Yeah. Um, and uh, Trevor Hensley, Scott, he painted uh, that that one, and it was gorgeous. It was absolutely stunning to see in real life. Um, and then um, the, I think the biggest maquette that we've done for Marvel was done for that movie, and that was the uh, Dwarf, Black, Black Dwarf, but it might have been called something else in the end. Really four and a half feet tall. Yeah, it was huge. Um, and uh, Ryan uh, Pintar and and, uh, and Jason Matthews painted that one. Um, but it, again, just the amount of detail that goes into those things is... is Incredible, and, and well, it's like getting the color of Thanos' skin correct. Yeah, we had to repaint it a couple times because it wasn't. We didn't feel it was quite correct. Too purple, or too blue, or too you know. But you have to get it to where it's right, so that on set you you know they don't have to change it. It's, and that that was a pretty remarkable character, Thanos. As a fully realized CGI character, after a few minutes, I just sort of believed that it was a guy. You know, it was just like, I thought that was really good. Yeah, the digital company did a, an incredible job on that. Yeah. But it was, um, I think um, uh, one of the things doing the cats at that kind of scale as well is that you you help not only the, the, the digital department, but the, the DP uh, and the directors in, in finding that certain textures that that are originally in a design as you grow it and then you you see it in, in real life and then you paint it, then you start sometimes you, you find that there's a little moraine that might happen, um, and so you have to kind of go back and change things that on the on your computer screen you don't really see that happening. But then when you actually have a, a physical uh, piece uh, with you, that's when you start going. Ooh, that's not going to work. That's going to that's going to cause problems on set. So you have to be diligent about always looking at the design, um, as kind of afresh at, at, at every stage of construction. So that you you try and you find the flaws in things, so that when you get to set, 
you kind of work out a lot of problems for for all departments at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nice to see that even with the fully digital characters, that that bringing in that physical element has remained a, a really valuable part of the step to make sure the end result is good. And and I totally agree with you, Shane. I thought Thanos in particular was one of the best digital characters I've I've ever seen. You know, not only the the design and the animation, but obviously Brolin's performance is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It's I like, mean, you know, it's a, it's a great when you've got the resources and the time. It's, a, yeah. it's an amazing tool to do for yeah. storytelling like that. And and that's a tall order. You're 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 he's he's a he's a guy you got to believe can can take on the Avengers and then some, and yeah. it really really work. It really worked. Well, the other the other thing that's great about the Marvel production team and the and the directors is that they I, I've never once heard them say that they're going to use just one technique in particular. It's always a good balance of of work. Some is uh, you know body makeups like the Guardians or or you know prosthetic makeups, physical suits, wearable pieces like the arms and hands and, and uh, you know, the, it, it's, they're so full, the, the films are so full of visual creations that you couldn't possibly do it all, you know, and, and I think we fit in, in into a nice and, and uh, acceptable place. I, I I don't think we could physically it's just from the physical demand of it. I don't think we could do much more. I think Which, it's, it's worth also, also pointing out that 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 they hire Marvel hire some really extraordinary VFX supervisors. Yeah. Whether it's Chris Townsend, the Dan Deleuze. Yeah, yeah, they're they are all really you know collaborative and. You know, it's just a it's a, it's a great experience working with these people because they know what they're looking for and and collaborate well with with everybody. They never talk down to people. They never they never uh, belittle anyone's work. It's always part of the process. So yeah, it's good. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, and it wouldn't it be great if all productions worked like a team like that? Um, well, I want to move yeah, on. Some of them are successful because they don't, you know. Exactly, exactly. All right, final question, guys. This is about the Guardians makeups. I know you guys got a chance to revisit those. Uh, you guys worked on Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, so what what that you learned on Gu- Guardians 2 were you able to apply on uh, the makeups as they appeared in Avengers Infinity War? It, it didn't change that much. I mean, it was the the, the formulas had pretty much been set. I mean, it, we, I think we made a new arm for Nebula mm-hmm. to make it more comfortable or change the design a little bit. Something happened in the story, but all right, we changed it. Had it. Yeah, you know, we had to change things on her because the actress likes to maintain her her unbelievably thick long hair. <laughs> and, uh, the first film they they. She shaved her head, as you know, so it was a much tighter fit. We had challenges trying to fit all of that underneath the head, but um, I think we we took all the work that, that David White and his team did and um, just modified it and corrected it to, to the to the uh, want of the producers, directors, and actors, and uh, you know it's, it's actually really fun. I'm I'm, I'm I'm actually personally devastated as to what's happening with that series right now. I think it's re- fairly ridiculous, but here we are. Well, that's, a, that's a topic for another blog. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just telling you personally. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Well, I, I have I to know. say that, 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 I mean, we we always try and say it, but, you know, I'm going to say it again anyway, that, you know, you know a shout-out to Dave White and his team on um, the original Guardians, because they did a lot of heavy lifting on that movie, and we were, you know, again very fortunate and 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 uh, um, not um, shocked, but we were kind of expecting him to do the second movie, um, 
and then we, of course we found out he was being shot in America, so we were we were lucky enough to get the show. But the work that him and his team did was 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 really great, and was the foundation of what we ended up, you know, doing taking his work and and changing it for, as Shane says, for the needs of of, uh, of James and, and the producers and what they wanted, you know, t- getting times down um, for uh, application and, and removal and, you know. A lot of testing was done, a lot of yeah. experimentation. It wasn't just a one-time redo. It was, it was multiple six, eight tests the piece of each care like there was a lot of, of experimentation and, and modification. Yeah. And we you know, we ended up doing thousands of appliances for guardians and four thousand two hundred and thirty two. Wow. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of work and and um and and figuring out how to how to you know like with Drax bring down his time and how to remove that. And um I think we beat his our times on Guardians on on AV three. Um, I can't remember exact time. Just under two hours. Yeah. Um, but um, they are some of my favorite things to to have done for the series, just because I love the characters. There's there's so much fun and, and the way they interacted with Tony Stark and I know just you know I love makeup. So it's it's always great to get to do those. Yeah, I was I was gonna say I think that's what probably made this a, a fuller experience for you guys is that makeup element in addition to the the suit amount elements and the the maquette work. But you guys got to really do it all in this movie. And uh, oh, and you, you know, guys, luckily, um, yeah, you know, uh, the the on set makeup coordinator uh, Brian Syke, he's been with us now for many years. And he's just really great at uh, uh, keeping that team because, you know, they're in different countries, they're in different states. We're not always there all the time. I, I try to be there as much as possible, but um, it, it's like in two-week spurts, you know, but you have to have your team internally that you can trust to really pull this off. And, like, from the from the costume and, and, and dressing of actors aspect, it's, it's always been Chris Swift and his team. And then the makeup team is Brian Seif and his team, which can be up to 33, you know, 40, 50, 60 people. Um, so you, you have to really rely on the people that are on set, boots on the ground every day, because that's, that's a lot of hours. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of continuity. But it's been a really good, uh, a really cohesive team. Well, guys, I think uh, that's a perfect place to wrap it up, this concept of team. Uh, this team, many members of the of the Legacy team have been working on this uh, Marvel adventure for 10 years now, and it's so great to see you guys uh, continuing to contribute. And uh, my final question to you is, who's your favorite Avenger? And then we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> you got to answer. God dang it. <laughs> got to do it. Got to do it. Uh, I don't know. I'd I'd fight, you know, who's your favorite kid, you know? All right, fine. You don't have to answer. You know, yeah, it has been 10 years, and and I didn't know how to take this, but Marvel gave us uh, anniversary walkers. Uh, (laughs) I don't know what that means, but... uh, Great. 